Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. After the presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session. To ask a question, please press star and then one. Now we'll turn the meeting over to your host, Allison Hunt. You may begin. Hello and welcome to this media briefing on the FDA's decision to postpone the February 15th Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee meeting to discuss Pfizer-BioNTech's request for authorizing a COVID-19 vaccine for children six months through four years of age. I'm Allison Hunt with the FDA's Office of Media Affairs. Dr. Peter Marks, Director of the FDA's Center for Biologics, Evaluation and Research, will provide brief remarks before answering questions. After the remarks, we will then move to the question and answer portion of the call. Reporters on the phone will be in a listen-only mode until we open the call for questions. As a reminder, this is an audio call being recorded and live streamed on the FDA's YouTube channel. When asking a question, please state your name and affiliation. Also, please ensure today's questions pertain to today's announcement and limit yourself to one question and one follow-up so we can get to as many questions as possible. With that, I will now turn the call over to Dr. Marks. Hey, thanks so much, and thanks very much to everyone for joining. Um, since the early days of the pandemic, we've always followed the science in this ever-changing situation. Given the recent Omicron surge and the notable increase in hospitalizations in the youngest children to their highest levels during the pandemic so far, we felt it was our responsibility as a public health agency to act with urgency and consider all available options, including requesting uh, that the company Pfizer provide us with initial data on two doses of, from its ongoing study. The goal was to understand if two doses would provide sufficient protection to move forward with authorizing the use of the vaccine in this age group. Our approach has always been to conduct a regulatory review that's responsive to the urgent public health needs created by the pandemic while adhering to our rigorous standards for safety and effectiveness. And evaluating these initial data have been useful in our review of these vaccines. But at this time, we believe additional information regarding the ongoing evaluation of a third dose should be considered. And so with that, I'll turn it back over to our moderator. Thank you, Dr. Marks. At this time, we'll begin the question and answer portion of the press conference. As a reminder, this call is being recorded. When asking a question, please state your name and affiliation. Also, please ensure questions pertain to today's announcement and limit yourself to one question so we can get to as many questions as possible. Operator, we will take the first question, please. Thank you. The first question comes from Michael Ehrman. Michael, your line is now open. Hi, uh, I, Mike Ehrman from Reuters. I, I just wanted to uh, see if you could clarify a little more what the rationale was for the delay here. Did, did staff not back authorization at two doses or, or was this due to, you know, the changing public health uh, situation uh, because of the, uh, the decrease in cases around the country? What's, what's the, the real, the, the big reason here behind the, uh, the delay? Actually, it's because data has come in so rapidly um, that we need to be able to look through the data and in looking through the data, um, we realize now in data that came in very rapidly because of the large number of uh, cases of Omicron um, that at, at this time, it, it makes sense for us to wait until we have the data from uh, the evaluation of a third dose uh, before taking action. Operator, we'll take the next question, please. Thank you. Our next question comes from Lauren Gardner. Lauren, your line is now open. Hi, thanks, Lauren Gardner from Politico. Do you think FDA scheduling this meeting and then canceling it while waiting for more evidence is going to feed into the perceptions that the data is weak around vaccines or that um, you know, ch children, uh, there's a, that there's a sufficient question out there of whether children should even get vaccinated and, you know, with respect to FDA general arguments about high standards for uh, for reviewing these sorts of things, do you think that's a message that parents are really understanding across the United States? 
Yeah, so we, we take our responsibility uh, for reviewing these vaccines very seriously because we're parents um, and uh, as well. And in, in looking over uh, these data, I think parents can feel reassured that we have set a standard uh, by which we uh, feel that if something does not meet that standard, um, we can't proceed forward. So rather than having any issue of, uh, of causing anyone to question the process, I hope this reassures people uh, that the process has a standard, that the process is one that we follow, and we follow the science uh, in making sure that anything that we authorize has the safety and efficacy that people have come to expect from our regulatory review of medical products. Operator, we'll take the next question, please. Thank you. Our next question comes from Helen Branswell with Stat News. Your line is now open. Thank you very much for taking my question. Dr. Marks, you just said that if something does not meet FDA standard, then the FDA cannot go forward. Are you saying that the data that you saw do not suggest that the vaccine is protective in the age groups under five? What, what, I'll, what I'll speak to here is rather than speaking to the data, what I can say is that uh, the, the data that we saw made us realize that we needed to see data from a third dose as in the ongoing trial in order to make a term, determination that uh, we could proceed with, uh, with doing an authorization. Operator, we'll take the next question, please. Thank you. Our next question comes from Meg Tyrell with CNBC. Your line is now open. Well, thanks. And Helen put the question better than I think anybody could have, but curious just to know about these new data. Were they not data that could have been anticipated before scheduling the meeting for next week? Um, and then as you await the three-dose data, will there be a certain time period of follow-up that you wait for after having three-dose data to consider authorizing the vaccine? So uh, let me just uh, say that, um, I, although I can't really comment on specifics, um, think about what's happened in the past month. Um, I don't know whether anyone could really predict what happened real well. Um, we had days when we were getting above three quarters of a million cases a day um, of Omicron, and we started to see a tremendous number of children affected by Omicron. So you could imagine uh, that if a clinical trial were going uh, on, any clinical trial, not necessarily this one, where some was looking at outcomes, uh, one might see information coming in very quickly. Now, we can't... Uh, predict that um, uh, ahead because we didn't know that Omicron was actually going to be on the scene uh, much before uh, the end of November. Um, so uh, what we're dealing with is taking the approach that we very much should take as a public health agency, which is to constantly take in the data that come to us and adjust to that. So what, what we're doing now is adjusting to this. Uh, and yes, some of this uh, was late breaking. Um, but that's what our job is, is to adjust to it. Um, and we'll obviously, uh, once the uh, next tranches of data come in, um, and I think the, the company has referred to when they uh, might be able to submit them, uh, we'll be uh, uh, looking at them in uh, an expeditious manner. Operator, we'll take the next question, please. Thank you. Our next question is from Cheyenne Hazlitt, ABC News. Your line is now open. Hi, thank you. Um, my first question is, is whether the dropping cases in the last two weeks um, changed the thinking on this at all. And, and also, uh, because parents are obviously going to be very upset by this news, can you offer some hope in talking through what the new timeline might look like for this vaccine's authorization? Now, let me let me say, first of all, that we realize the need for a vaccine uh, for COVID-19, even with the drop in the number of cases, um, we're still having a tremendous number of cases here. 
And we realize that there is urgency for those parents who really feel this. We, we uh, empathize with them um, because I suspect that they're not only concerned about um, the current situation, even though there's a drop in cases, but they're concerned about future variants uh, that could potentially come along. And that's how we're thinking as well. So this, this was not based. Uh, on the uh, dropping number of cases, because it's still a staggering number of cases each day that we're having. Um, uh, and in terms of looking forward towards the future, um, I think what it does mean is that for the next few months, uh, while these additional data are gathered, um, parents will have to rely on what they've come to do well, which is they're uh, using masking procedures uh, and they're making sure that they're vaccinated um, and taking those types of precautions with their youngest children. Um, we will do our part, obviously, uh, to move as fast as we can when we have the data. But for now, um, uh, we'll have to ask parents to help to continue to do what they've been doing. Operator, we will take the next question, please. Thank you. Our next question comes from Matt Perrone, Associated Press. Your line is now open. Hi, thank you. Is it safe to say that, you know, by waiting for this data, you'll be able to, you know, eventually make this decision based on actual um, infections, actual clinical data, rather than the uh, antibody levels and, and uh, immunobridging uh, analysis that, that you were originally considering? I think that's probably a safe assumption. Operator, we have time for one last question, please. Our last question comes from Lori McGinley, Washington Post. Your line is now open. Thank you. Thanks so much for doing the call. Um, Dr. Marks, um, Pfizer said that they would probably have additional data by early April. Um, does that mean that we could look forward to a resolution of this, perhaps authorization by mid-April? And also, um, in terms of what factored into your decision, it's part of this because um, Omicron is, is, is somewhat less, of, the uh, vaccines are some, somewhat less effective against Omicron than against Delta, and your later data was more Omicron, and your earlier data was part Omicron and part, data, part Delta? Yeah, let, let, let me speak to that last piece. I really can't speak to the specifics of, the, uh, of this, but it is true that we have seen, I mean, it's just a fact aside from this, that there have been uh, evolution of COVID-19 from uh, Delta into Omicron uh, while trials have been ongoing. And um, that has, has provided uh, challenges, obviously, because um, uh, the uh, protection against Omicron uh, from uh, the current mRNA vaccines um, is not as great as it was uh, to uh, Delta. Uh, nonetheless, it was still quite good in preventing uh, serious uh, 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 disease. Um, in, in terms of the timing, um, we are absolutely committed to moving um, as rapidly as we can once we have a submission. And although I can't give you an exact timing, um, uh, you're aware of our uh, kind of our record over the, over the past, uh, past year, uh, in, in proceeding very rapidly uh, when we have important data that come in. And, and, and this would obviously be um, very important data. Um, uh, I, I think uh, we owe it to the parents of uh, small children in the country to proceed in that manner. Thank you, Dr. Mark. This concludes today's FDA press conference. A replay will be available on our YouTube page. If you have follow-up questions, please don't hesitate to contact our press office at fdaoma at fda.hhs.gov. Thanks and have a great day. Bye.